Well, good morning and welcome to Paradise Church. My name is Austin Penn and I'm so thankful that you decided to tune in this morning. Whether this is your first time or whether you've been with us for the 12 to 13 weeks we've been on YouTube due to the virus, I just want to say welcome and thank you for being here. You see, we're in an interesting place in our world, in history, and in our church. For those of you that are a part of Paradise Church, you know that our church prior to all of this was in crisis and transition. We had half of our staff gone within a month before the pandemic hit, and then we had the pandemic hit, which changed everything about church as we knew it. And then we had the stay-at-home order, which changed a lot of things about our economy with people losing jobs and things like that. Um, and now we've had these past couple weeks in response to George Floyd's murder and many others. We've had civil rights protests taking place in our world, in our nation, and it's a crazy time of transition, a crazy time where where everything, so much is happening, and everyone has their opinions on each of these, on, on our church situation, on the pandemic, on the economy, on the civil rights protests, like everyone has their own opinions on all of this, which creates a very easy place for conflict. And I'm reminded I'm reminded of the funny video, the funny TV series, Friends, where Ross buys a couch and tries to put his couch up into his apartment. And for some reason, the couch just isn't fitting, and he's having all of his friends help twist and move this, and he just keeps yelling, pivot, pivot, pivot. Clearly, the couch is not working. It's not fitting. We need to pivot. We need to do something different. And in the end, you know, the couch doesn't fit. It, it's such a funny scene because so many of us can relate to it. So many of us have moved furniture or moved a couch or helped a friend move a couch. And, and there's people on the sidelines that are saying like, hey, maybe you could try it this way or like, no, that definitely won't work. And then there's the people holding it that are like, come on, let's do this. I, I totally got a plan. And then like, it doesn't work. And then we've got the people that are just silent, but still doing the work and they're, they're holding things up and they're just kind of waiting for the other people to, to kind of figure out a plan and get this thing moving. And it's just so funny because I feel like perhaps many of us, regardless of which of these situations I named or countless other that you're experiencing, I feel that many of us could perhaps be trying to fit a couch into a stairwell, into a place where it just isn't fitting anymore. Our world is different. It requires us to pivot. Pivot has been a word that many organizations are using as they're kind of trying to figure out how to restructure. Churches are using it. How do we pivot here? And we've had to pivot in all of these different areas. And so it feels like we're pivoting and we're pivoting and we're pivoting and we're moving all over the place and we're not quite sure what's going to come next. And that's our new series. Our new series is called Pivot, Reimagining our new normal together. This idea of pivoting, of reimagining a new way forward is not uncommon in the Bible. In fact, you're going to hear stories throughout this summer from all over the Bible of people that have had to reimagine a different way of life. This, this word reimagining, this word pivot, kind of makes me think of the Greek word that Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry, metanoia which means repentance. And this repentance is not just simply like a grief, like a man I've messed up, but instead it's, it's a change in thinking and it's a change in direction. It's a pivot. It's a pivot to recognize that where we were going before, the way that we were, something has to change. It doesn't fit anymore. And so we need to pivot. We need to reimagine. And it's even better when we do it together. And so this morning, as I kind of cast the vision for this whole summer, I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. And as you turn there, um, I want to give you some context to this. So in this book, this is from Paul to the church at Ephesus, and right before our text, he talks about putting on the new self and putting off the old self. And he's using this language to people that have just now become believers, that have just started to follow Jesus, saying those old ways that you used to do things, those, those need to be put behind you. And there's this new self, this new person that needs to be put 
before you. It's a new way of living, a new way forward. And so today, I've entitled my sermon, Reimagining Yourself. Reimagining Yourself. Our world, our church, our economy is different. And you're different because of that. I'm reminded of uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who in an interview was asked, as they looked around in his library, they said, do you read all these books? Have you read all these books? And his response was, what, this year? (laughs) And the, the reporter was confused and asked, what? do you read these books every year? Why, why would you do that? Why would you read the same books every single year? And, and Bonhoeffer, in his Bonhoeffer way, said, the books may be the same, but every year I'm different. And so that's where I want you to see where we're coming from today, that our world is different, and because of that, you're different. Your perspective is different. And so before we go any further, we must reimagine ourselves. And so Ephesians 4, 25 through 32 says this. It says, therefore, which connects us to the text before that I just told you about, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. And let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. The word of the Lord this morning to you all. So this morning from this text that I just read to you, I want to share with you some things that I believe God is calling us to put behind us and some things instead we should be putting in front of us, before us. And so I'm going to give five of those examples drawn from our text this morning. And it's kind of a choose your own adventure. Maybe one of these speaks to you and you can say, man, this is something I really need to put behind me and put something else in front of me instead. Maybe all five speak to you. I hope so. I know they spoke to me. And so the first one that we have is this. It's put behind you falsehood and instead put before you truth. This falsehood, this word that's being used here, William Barclay says, is really two different kinds of lies. It's the lies of speech, but it's also the lies of silence. You see, we can give falsehood through our words by actively saying things that we know are not true. But we can also lie in our silence by allowing things to happen that we know are not true, are not good. These are things that we are called to put behind us and instead put truth before us. And the reason we put truth before us is because we're called to speak truth and honesty to our neighbors, which is everyone from our family to the entire globe. And we do that because we recognize that we are one. We are one faith. We are one humanity. We are one world. That there's something between all of us that exists. And so truth should be held. We must put behind us falsehood and instead put truth in front of us. Because truth brings about unity. When we're constantly spewing falsehood, whether through our speech or through our silence, it breeds disunity. It breeds people going in different directions because they just don't know what is true. But when we are true, when we are honest, then it brings about the opportunity for unity. 
put behind you falsehood, and instead put before you truth. The next thing that I would ask that this text asks of us to put behind us and put in front of us is to put behind us bitterness and instead put before us forgiveness. The Greek word for bitterness that is used here is really kind of like a long-standing resentment. It's bitterness that has been kept, that has been harvested, and that still exists. Covenant pastor of Bayside Church's Ray Johnston says in his book, Hope Quotient, he says, bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. It's foolish in his book that he talks about. It's foolish to hold on to bitterness because it only pains us. It's only toxic towards us. And the way that this text tells us about bitterness and how it plays out is in these ways, in unresolved anger, in wrath, in clamor. And in clamor, what it's talking about here is like weeping, like a kid that is weeping uncontrollable, uncontrollably even though the situation has been solved. Slander, which is blaspheming and disgracing other people and, and taking people that have some sort of fame, if you will, or some sort of status and specifically speaking against that status, saying they don't deserve that role, they aren't that good. That's slander and malice. And malice points us towards a difficult and distressing time and circumstances. When I read that word and looked at it in the Greek, I was like, man, that's us. I don't know about you, but I feel like this is difficult. It's difficult to know what to say, what not to say, when to speak, when to listen. It's difficult to know what to do because we're not even really sure. And it's really distressing. It's really distressing because of all of those things I just named. And so it's so easy for us in this season to hold on to these things, to hold on to the bitterness of anger, wrath, clamor, slander, and malice. But God calls us instead to put those behind us and instead, as believers, put forgiveness in front of us. Because forgiveness brings about restoration. And what's interesting here is that this word forgiveness has a a nuanced theme that when you forgive someone, you lose control. You have to release control. And so say perhaps you have a very valid reason to be bitter, to be angry, to have wrath. You control it. And in forgiveness, we're asked to release that control, to release our power, and instead let God come in. Let God come in and heal. Forgiveness brings about the restoration. And so we're called as believers to put behind us this bitterness that we hold on to that is so toxic to us and instead put forgiveness in front of us. The next thing that we see here is that we should be putting blame behind us and instead we should put opportunity before us. I'm thinking specifically of our text and how it talks about a thief and how instead of letting this person thieve from you or steal from you, that instead you should give them a job, give them honest work, so that then, in turn, they can be a blessing to someone else. How easy would it be in this time period? There were so many people that were stealing just for food on the table, just for their family to live. It wasn't, it wasn't something that people just did. You, you always have a reason for stealing. And he is calling this church at Ephesus, and I believe to us as well, that when someone, even if they intentionally wrong us, instead of blaming them and putting them in a a negative space that we want nothing to do with them, that rather instead we would see this moment as a place of opportunity. I'm reminded of a story that my wife told me of this little old lady who in the middle of the night heard a window break. And so she, she looked up, and lo and behold, there was a young man, very erratic, standing at the foot of her bed, asking for jewelry. 
and her in her, I'm sure, dazed state wakes up and notices that, you know, if, if I wake up my husband, if I wake up my son, this is going to turn violent. This is going to become a, a blaming and angering environment. And so instead, she wakes up in, in the strength of this little old lady to basically put her arm around this young person and say, well, I don't, don't have any money. Um, let's, let's see what we can do for you. And, and, and talks with him and walks with him through their house and gets him to the front door. And, and just as, as this young man is about to be ushered out of this situation, um, he notices that she has a very expensive watch. And he, he just kind of mumbles and points at it. And she, in, in her knowledge and in her wisdom, just takes off the watch and gives it to this young man. You see, it would have been so easy for her not to see the opportunity in that moment where harm's being done to her. But as believers, we're called to a radical faith that loves our enemies. We're called to put blame behind us, even if it's rightful blame. And instead, look at the opportunity that we have here in that moment with that person to love them well, to love them as our neighbor, to love them as ourselves. You see, this opportunity brings hope. Opportunity brings hope, and hope is powerful. And so we're called as believers to put behind us blame and instead put in front of us opportunity. The next thing that I want us to see is found in verse 29. And I believe that God's calling us to put behind us corruption and corrupting talk and instead put in front of us edification and edifying talk. One of my favorite authors, Abraham Joshua Heschel, he's a Jewish scholar, he says that words create worlds. The words that you say and the words that you receive create the world in which you live. And as Proverbs 12, 18 says, it says that the words, uh, the, the swift words are like sword thrusts. Hasty words, not thought through words, are like sword thrusts that harm people. But that the words of the wise, they bring healing. You see, your words create worlds. And as believers, we're called to put behind us the words that tear others down that degrade other people, that corrupt other people, that corrupt communities. And instead, we're called to put on edifying and loving language. Because edifying brings healing. I look at our world, I look at our, our social media. We need healing. We need edification. We don't need corruption and degrading. We need love. We need love to exist to bring healing, edifying speech. And the last thing that I want to challenge us to do, that I believe God in the scriptures is challenging us to do, is to put behind us justification and instead put before us reflection. You see, throughout this text, it would be easy to use it to justify wrong actions. One that I'm thinking of specifically is it says, be angry and do not sin. Sweet. <laughs> I've got a license to be angry. But that doesn't mean that we have a license to be angry. It doesn't mean that we can just, in our selfishness and anger and wanting things to be our way, that we can just go in anger and that it's justified by God. Taking our actions and finding ways to justify them is not the way of Jesus. In fact, the, what's very fascinating, I believe, about the Bible is, is we don't really see Jesus and God use the language of right and wrong. Really, we see God and Jesus and the Spirit use the language of following and not following. You see, you cannot follow Jesus and justify things to make it look and feel like we're following Jesus. but we should be doing it the other way. We should be reflecting on Jesus's character, following his ethics and his behavior and his way and the things he calls us to do. 
instead of justifying the things that we've already done. That's what it actually means by be angry and sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath and do not a lot, give the devil an opportunity. You see, because Paul, as he's talking to the church of Ephesus, recognizes that if you are angry and you don't resolve the issue with someone, that then it becomes a problem of yourself and not following Jesus and instead justifying your anger, saying, I'm right, they're wrong, they're the one that has to come to forgive me. Like, that I was on the right side of this. And Paul recognizes that when we do that, we allow the enemy a foothold. And it just takes one of those footholds for things to start turning down and us to just begin to justify all of our behaviors and things that we do that Jesus never called us to do or to be. And that's actually why in verse 30 it says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Wow, what a phrase. That one stuck out to me. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. What does it mean there? What it means there is that the Holy Spirit of God sits as our counselor. Spirit is counselor. And as a good counselor, he reserves the right to both comfort us and to convict us. And both are love. Both are love from the Holy Spirit, but sometimes when we get convicted and it hurts because it's too fresh, because it's too real, because we don't want to change it, because it requires something of us to lose, the reason we get so upset about that is because we don't want to pivot. We don't want to metanoia. We don't want to change. And we get convicted by the Holy Spirit, and perhaps we want to grieve that. We say, God, I know you want me to do that, but I don't want to do that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. He is counselor, a counselor of love. And sometimes that love comes across as comfort, and sometimes it comes across as conviction. And the reason we, we need all these things is in the conclusion of our passage. It says, and we forgive others as God in Christ forgave you. You see, as you look through this text, you'll actually see a lot of reflection on God, on the Spirit, on Jesus' behaviors and characteristics. And that we need to tie that in to our actions and not fall into the trap of just justifying what we're doing and, and, and you know, picking and choosing maybe Bible verses to say, this is, this is why it's okay for me to do this. But rather, we're called to put that behind us, to put behind us the justification and saying, you know, I'm, I'm really not that bad, or I'm, I, I don't have to work on that, or that doesn't apply to me, and finding some way to justify it all. But instead, when we put the reflection, the reflectiveness on God, on spirit, on Jesus and his character, and we put that in front of us, we don't have to worry so much about the justifying, because then we're following. We're not worried about the right and wrong narrative. We're worried about following and not following. And this reflection, it brings clarity. I've learned, uh, I believe at a very young age, that the more and more I go through this life, the less and less I want to be reactionary. I want to be reflective. I want to think deeply about things. I want to take a month to think about something that God is calling me to and to make sure that it's not my own being and self thinking I should do this or say this or act upon this, but rather to reflect on, on God's character and say, am I following him here? Reflection brings clarity. And so my challenge to you is to put behind you justification, this right-wrong narrative, and instead put before you following. Put reflection in front of you. And so in conclusion, uh, I believe God is calling you. I believe God is calling me. I believe God is calling us as a community to reimagine a new way forward, to pivot, to metanoia, to repent not in just a grief way, but in a change of mindset, in a change of direction. 
But we can't do this reimagining until we authentically examine ourselves. And so that's my challenge for me. That's my challenge for you this week, is to examine yourself, to reflect on these things that this text, and I believe God is calling us to put behind us and instead put different things in front of us. To ask the question, to reflect upon, God, where do I need to pivot? What do I need to metanoia about? Reflect on those questions. Maybe pray them daily. See what God may unveil to you. Perhaps he's calling you to put off some falsehood, some lies that you said in your speech or in your silence. Perhaps he's calling you to put some bitterness behind you, some things you've been holding on to that you were not created and designed to carry on. Maybe he's calling you to put blame behind you, people you've blamed, maybe yourself, maybe others. Maybe God's calling you to put corrupting talk behind you, to instead speak words of life and love to other people. Maybe God's calling you to put behind the justification of your actions. I don't know where God's speaking to you, but I pray that you would reflect on that. I pray that you would authentically examine yourself this week to see, God, where do I need to pivot? Where are you reimagining me to move? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are good to us. You are good to us in the midst of chaos. You are good to us in distressing times, in difficult times. God, you are counselor. You are counselor, and sometimes it hurts in a convicting way, and sometimes it it just feels so good to be comforted and loved by you. But God, you are loving us in both of those moments. And so, Father, I pray so deeply, so deeply, that you would work in our lives, that you would show us where we need to pivot, where we need to metanoia, where we need to not just grieve, but to repent and reimagine a new way forward. Reimagine a new way forward as people, as individuals, as families, as communities, as our church, as a nation. God, we need you. God, we love you. And God, we're thankful for all that you've done, all that you're doing in the moment of chaos. And God, all that we know you're going to do. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Grace and peace and blessings to you all this week.